Well, hi, this is Elizabeth, and I have the privilege of getting to share with you the very last chapter now in Luke. That's Luke 24. Now, there are 53 verses in this chapter. What I do want us to really kind of go through and talk about some of the wonderful things that we're going to find in here as Luke is now um, completing the book about Jesus' life that he wrote. So let's begin by just looking at these first 10 verses in chapter 24. But very early on Sunday morning, the woman went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this, so they rushed back from the tomb to tell his eleven disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. So here Luke is beginning to talk about the fact that Jesus had risen from the grave. And um, the women had had to wait until the Sabbath was over before they could go and really uh, try to give his body proper burial with the proper spices. But he wasn't there. And um, so uh, let's look in a little bit of a different account about what really happened. Let's go to Matthew 28, and I want to read the first five verses. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women, Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. And then, of course, he went, they went on, the angel went on to tell them that he had risen from the dead, just, just as it had been foretold. And it's very, very common when you're looking all through Scripture that if people really see an angel or they see the Lord appearing right in front of them, they often fall down. <laughs> I think that's pretty understandable. So there was this earthquake, and then this angel appeared, and the guards just fell into a dead faint. There was just, they shone with such power. So now they had seen that Jesus wasn't there. And, you know, that stone didn't have to be rolled away for Jesus to be able to get out. After he was resurrected, he seemed to be able to appear anywhere he needed to be, that he, you know, everywhere he wanted to go. But that stone needed to be rolled away so that people could get in and see that he was no longer there, that he had risen from the grave. Now, in John 20, 2 through 4, we find out that um, John, you know, went with Peter then, um, after the woman came back and told them what had happened, um, Peter ran to the grave, and um, John went with him. And um, if we look in John 20, 2 through 4, this is talking about Mary. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He refers to himself that way. And she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple, it was John, started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And so we know that Peter and John ran to the tomb. And I want to go ahead in John 20 and read verses 6 and 7. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. John got there first. He, uh, he ran faster than Peter, but then Peter went in first. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. And that is really actually quite 
significant. And I think it's wonderful that that was included. John was with Peter, so this was something John saw. And he understood the significance, and he was careful to include that in his account of Jesus' resurrection. Whenever there would be uh, someone that would be having dinner with someone, or they had company or guests, if the guest had to leave the table where they were all reclined, and he wasn't going to be returning, he was done, then his cloth, his napkin that he was using there would just be kind of put on the table. But if he wanted to let them know that he was going to be coming back, he wasn't finished yet, he would fold the napkin very nicely, leave there. That would let the host know, I'm coming back. Isn't that awesome that the cloth around Jesus' head was folded and set aside there? Because Jesus was telling everybody, and especially within the Jewish culture, I'm coming back. I'm not completely done. I will return. I just thought that was always such a cool thing. So, after we have the account there in Luke of um, the men coming and, and you know also seeing that Jesus was not in the tomb, then we start to give an account here of a walk that two men were taking to the town of Emmaus. So these were Jesus' followers, and um, this village of Emmaus was about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were walking along and talking about everything that had happened. And then Jesus just kind of came and suddenly was walking with them. But it says here in verse 16, Luke 24, 16, but God kept them from recognizing him. And so they did not recognize that this was Jesus. In verses 17 and 18, it says, he asked them, Jesus, he asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, He must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there in the last few days. And we really need to understand that not only was it very important for Jesus to be crucified and given as that offering at Passover, because he was the final Passover lamb so that everyone could find forgiveness and they would not have to come into destruction and death, um, you know, as separation from God. Jesus was that absolute perfect Passover lamb, so his crucifixion at the time of Passover was very significant. But also we have to realize that there are three festivals. Um, there is Passover, Pentecost, and then the um, Festival of Tents, where every, at least every man, every male that was Jewish was required to come to Jerusalem um, from anywhere, from as far away as Rome. I mean, they, they lived all over the place, and they were coming to Jerusalem um, during this very important feast, this very important time. So Jerusalem was cram-packed. And there were people there from absolutely all over the place. So this wasn't something that, you know, well, the disciples found out Jesus had risen and they were, you know, talking to a few people they knew. <laughs> this was big news. His crucifixion, well, it started out with the fact that Jesus' fame really escalated after he raised raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus lived with his sisters, um, Mary and Martha, close to Jerusalem. It was creating such a, a reaction that the Bible says that the leaders were wanting to, they were considering killing Lazarus as well as killing Jesus to try to stop all of this. So Jesus was already gaining huge fame. He had come into the city with a big hue and cry of people proclaiming him, you know, that he was the Messiah entering into Jerusalem. His crucifixion would have been known everywhere. And now his body's gone and he's resurrected. This was big news everywhere. Um, you know, and this was something that was going to be taken, you know, all throughout um, the, the whole 
king, you know, all the areas where there were Jews, because they were there when this was happening. It's another reason why Pentecost was so significant when the Holy Spirit came and all this preaching was done uh, in all these different languages and thousands came to belief in Jesus. Once again, there were people from everywhere and they took this message back home. Before Paul ever got to Rome, Jews took the message of Christ. The, the, these, these Jews that had become believers, they started a church in Rome before Paul ever got there. And so it was very, very significant. And that's why these men are saying, you got to be the only one ever around here that doesn't know what's been going on um, with, with what's happened. And now, and saying, you know, that um, what had happened, Jesus had been crucified, and then talking about how that they, his body had disappeared. And, you know, if we look in verse 21 here, in this account of these two men and Jesus, one thing they said to Jesus was that, we had hoped he was the Messiah who would come to rescue Israel. And this all happened three days ago. You know, it says it right there. Um, the people were really wanting the king, the, the, the Messiah, the, the one who would save them from Rome. You know, when they were crying out as, as Jesus came in on, on um, uh, the triumphant entry, they were proclaiming him as being the one who was going to save them, that was going to set them free. They wanted the second coming Jesus. He was going to be coming back. The second coming, he would be the lion. He would be the king. And that's what they were wanting when Jesus came. But that's his second coming when he comes back to reign in might and power as a mighty lion and the king of all kings. But when Jesus came first, he didn't come as the lion. He came as the lamb. He was the sacrifice. He's our Redeemer. And the people here after Jesus' death, so many had lost hope. These two men are leaving the other, other believers and just going to Emmaus. They're, they're going away from Jerusalem, away from the disciples, going to Emmaus. And I think people had really been despairing and had lost hope. But they didn't realize that Jesus coming as the sacrificial lamb had actually brought them incredible, real hope hope. It's the hope that we all need desperately, that, that we can be forgiven. We have needed a Savior, and that's what Jesus had just brought, was that salvation. So then Jesus responds to them in verses 25 through 27. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now when they talk about that this was the, the writings of Moses and all the prophets, that basically covers the entire Old Testament um, writings, the Old Testament scriptures. And I want to share with you probably some of the passages that Jesus may have reminded them of. Um, Genesis 3.15. Now this was after um, Adam and Eve had eaten of that fruit that they'd been forbidden to have in the garden. And God is addressing the serpent that had deceived them. He says, I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This was like the first truly um, messianic prophecy given that the day would come when this um, seed of woman, when, when Jesus would be wounded in the heel by the enemy, but he would strike the enemy in the head. That is a fatal wound. That he would be ultimately, you know, ultimately destroyed. His power would be taken from him. Um, Psalm 22 is incredible. I'm going to read only a few verses from it, but you need to read that whole psalm. And um, God worked through David as an incredible prophet. And so let's look here. Psalm 22 is, is incredibly prophetic about Jesus. It starts out in the very first verse. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? And then... Let's look at verses 7 through 10. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads, saying, 
Is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. Yet you brought me safely from my mother's womb and led me to trust you at my mother's breast. I was thrust into your arms at my birth. You have been my God from the moment I was born. When you think about Jesus, those are incredible words. Now, there's a real good, very strong possibility as we understand crucifixion that it jerked your arms out of their sockets. It was oh, horribly, horribly painful. And also, I've, I've done a study about this before, that there is a physical condition where the stress is so intense on a person that their heart muscle um, starts to just degenerate and it can start to kind of shred and fall apart. Um, it, it, this actually happened. It's usually in like definitely older people, um, but it, it can happen and it's a real thing. And the stress that was put on Jesus at the crucifixion, no one else has ever had to endure something like that. And it says here in verse 14 here in Psalm 22, My life is poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. Whew. Verse 16, My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs, and evil gain closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Verse 17 and 18, I can count all my bones. Remember, they never broke Jesus' legs. Count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. These are all directly fulfilled in the crucifixion of Jesus. It is incredible. If we look then in Psalm 110, uh, in verses 1 through 4, uh, these... These are scriptures that are, are spoken of and directly quoted um, in Hebrews. And then I really, really want to encourage you to read Isaiah 52, 13 through 15, and then read all of Isaiah 53. I can't really take time right now to read that whole chapter, but if you have never read those scriptures and thought about how that they are directly talking about Jesus, you need to do so. They are kind of mind-blowing how accurately and amazingly that they have predicted, uh, there's been a prophecy of this, this Lamb of God who would lay his life down for us. It just gives me, absolutely gives me goosebumps. This is what things Jesus could have been talking to those men on the road to Emmaus that it was about him, that even though he wasn't the, the king who was going to just conquer Rome and set them free at that time, but that he was fulfilling these scriptures, especially this in Isaiah. And then when they got to Emmaus, um, the men asked him, you know, please come in and sit and eat with us. And um, so he went home with them, but as they're sitting down to eat, he broke the bread and blessed it. And then he gave it to them, and they recognized him. Their eyes were open, and they recognized him for who he was. And then he just disappeared. And so, um, you know, at that point, they're like, oh, my goodness, didn't we, didn't we realize? Our hearts were, like, burning within us when he was explaining all these scriptures to us. And within an hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem, and they found the 11 disciples. Then um, Jesus did appear to the whole group of disciples that were there. And at first they were very frightened. <laughs> they were like, whoa. But he said, peace be with you. And they, they were afraid they were seeing a ghost. But he didn't want them to be frightened. And we can learn a lot. It's really cool. We can learn a lot about what our resurrected bodies are going to be like by seeing what it was like when Jesus came back. Because he was the first to have a resurrected body. If I read in um, verses, this is, of course, Luke 24, verses 38 through um, 43. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I'm not a ghost, because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. 
and as he spoke, he showed them his hands and feet. Still, they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. And so, you know, they, they could touch him. He was eating, but he also could just suddenly appear places or suddenly disappear. He certainly had more than the normal amount of um, abilities that a person has in, in their body. And um, so it, it's things that we can understand a little bit more about what our resurrected bodies are going to be like. When the Bible talks about the marriage feast of the Lamb, there's probably going to be real feasting. And um, we'll be tremendously, oh, you know, I'm just believing I'll be able to fly. But we're just going to be tremendously less fragile. We, we will have bodies that can't be corrupted or be damaged or hurt. But we will still have bodies. And um, go ahead and read. 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 50, talking about us having those wonderful resurrected bodies someday. So he helps us to see what that's going to be like. I think that's really cool. So Jesus stayed. Um, after he was resurrected, he stayed for 40 days. You can see that in Acts 1, 3. And I do want to go ahead and read 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 9. Now, this is talking about after Jesus was resurrected. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have died. Then he was seen by James, I'm sure that was his brother James, and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. And of course, this is now Paul speaking. For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. There was more than 500 people um, who saw Jesus in the time between um, him being resurrected and him ascending up into heaven. And uh, like I said, there was a lot of people around. And, um, oh, I'm sure this just spread like crazy everywhere. So if we look now at the very end of the book of um, Luke. I'm going to start reading 44 and go right on to the very end of the book. And then after he'd eaten the fish, <laughs> then he said, when I was with you before I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he had, for, for his first coming, he fulfilled all of it. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven, which happened at the time of Pentecost. Then Jesus led them to Bethany, and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. So they worshipped him and then returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy, and they spent all their time in the temple praising God. So he, he did everything he could to help them to understand and to be prepared, and then of course the Holy Spirit was going to come and just dwell within them and reveal all that they needed to know to them. So I love the book of Luke. Um, Luke was a, a Greek doctor, and he also wrote the book of Acts. And he was a very good friend to Paul. And um, so I think it's been wonderful for all of us to have had a chance to go all the way through this wonderful book. All right, you be blessed. I'm glad I've had a chance to share this with you. We'll have somebody coming next week to continue to share God's word. Bye-bye. <laughs>